The Sorento is Kia's largest SUV, and this fourth generation model offers the kind of typically complete package we now expect from the brand. This enhanced design is embellished by electrified engine tech, smarter looks, and advanced media connectivity. And as before, it sells in the upper part of the SUV D segment, offering more space and 4x4 prowess than cheaper class contenders provide. Let's say you want a decently sized SUV for family duties. It needs to be tough and practical, but also comfortable and plush. You'd like to reflect the current trend towards electrification. You require seven seats with a third row large enough to actually use, and a few extra touches of luxury wouldn't go amiss. Or well, Kia claims what you need is this, their fourth generation Sorento, a model that they've fundamentally improved as we're gonna see in this film. Traditionally, Sorento values have been based on no-nonsense virtues like space, versatility, and affordability. And that's certainly what characterized the first generation original BL series Sorento, which was launched back in 2002 with a crude old ladder frame chassis and a focus on off-road ability. It didn't make much sales headway because by the noughties, customer preferences when it came to large family-sized SUVs had changed quite a lot. Kia reflected these better with the design of the two subsequent Sorento models, the second generation XM series model of 2009, and this current car's direct predecessor, the third generation UM model of 2014, which both offered seven seats and switched to a more car-like monocoque chassis for better on-road drive dynamics both of which readied us for the big step forward in technology and price that characterizes this much more sophisticated MQ4 series design. Launched in 2020 and tasked with building on the 3 million sales already generated by this model line. Nearly all of those cars were diesel powered, but Kia knows that now has to change. A token 2.2 litre CRDI variant is still offered in the range, but the Korean brand's emphasis here is now firmly on petrol hybrid power, both of the full hybrid self-charging HEV kind and of the PHEV plug-in variety. And that's what we've got here. All of this technology is shared with this car's close cousin and its most direct rival, the Hyundai Santa Fe, although Kia offers it slightly more affordably. And there is quite a price to pay for it. The figures required for Sorento ownership now don't even start until the £40,000 price point. And you could easily find yourself paying the best part of £50,000 for a PHEV variant like this one. Yes, for a Sorento. But to be fair to Kia, those are the kinds of figures that you'll also need for comparably sized and powerful versions of the seven seat D segment family sized SUVs that this car aims to compete with. Models like Land Rover's Discovery Sport, Skoda's Kodiak, Volkswagen's Tiguan Allspace, say it's Taraco, and the Toyota Highlander. Tough competition then, faced down by what is unquestionably the most sophisticated Sorento model yet. Let's get to know it a bit better with the industry's most comprehensive test. For us, it seems strange to be driving a Kia Sorento and not hearing a familiar diesel rumble from beneath the bonnet, and it will be for many customers of the previous generations of this car. A diesel can still be had here, the brand's familiar 2.2 litre CRDR unit, but the Korean maker wants to persuade you that a petrol hybrid engine is going forward a better solution, specifically a 1.6 litre sized one. There are two options available here, a full hybrid self-charging HEV model and the pricier PHEV plug-in hybrid we're trying today. Kia makes much of its latest smart stream petrol powertrain development. Uh, the unit in question here features a combination of direct injection and of the company's latest continuously variable valve duration technology. But even so, you might well worry, as we did actually coming to this test, that asking a little 1.6 litre four-cylinder petrol engine to power a two-ton seven-seat family SUV of this kind is a bit ambitious. Automotive giant Toyota certainly thought so. Uh, their engineers think a power plant of 2.5 litres in size is necessary to propel their almost identically sized contender in this class, the Highlander. 
That model is only offered as a self-charging petrol hybrid, but the Kia Hyundai conglomerate is determined to make the whole downsized engine concept work, and its approach which will seem to have some validity if the first Sorento variant that you try is the PHEV plug-in model that we're testing here. Its 90 horsepower electric motor does a reasonable job of powering the car in battery motion mode um, and when the 13.8 kilowatt hour battery pack uh, finally runs out and the 1598cc turbo petrol engine cuts in, uh, the combined power output, 261 brake horsepower, is more than enough for most safe overtakes or for pressing on when you're late for the school pickup. Uh, 62 occupies 8.4 seconds on the way to 119 miles an hour in a Sorento PHEV. You certainly wouldn't want to go any faster in a car like this. But you might want to go a little quicker in the alternative self-charging HEV hybrid that most Sorento folk are likely to choose. Here the combined total motor and combustion performance figure falls to 226 horsepower and at times when the powertrain is relying primarily on the electric motor it's sometimes evident, uh, particularly when you're fully loaded or on inclines, that its output, which is reduced in the HEV to just 59 brake horsepower, is a touch on the light side. Plus, of course, with the self-charging HEV version of this car, you get an electrical propulsion system relying on a much smaller battery. This one's just 1.49 kilowatt hours in size. The result of all that is that the 1.6 litre TGDI petrol engine kicks in, uh, sometimes quite vocally, virtually all the time in usual driving. Even around town, where you'd hope the benefits of hybrid power would really start to shine through. Still, at least when you are using the engine, say during heavy acceleration, uh, Resta 62 in the HEV takes 8.7 seconds. At least you're not flushing fuel through an inefficiently large capacity power plant. And at least you're not saddled with the kind of somewhat unresponsive belt-driven CVT automatic gearbox that you have to have in a Toyota product in this segment, in a RAV4, a Highlander, a Lexus RXL, uh, take your pick. Uh, this Kia's six-speed auto is of the proper metal cogged variety, which means that you don't put your foot down and then wait until a rubber belt spools itself up to eventually obey your command. It's hardly lightning fast in its reactions though, which might occasionally make you want to use the provided steering wheel paddle shifters, and neither this transmission nor the uh, little 1.6 litre petrol engine are sufficiently well endowed to be able to facilitate the kind of properly high capacity brake towing weight that uh, quite a few customers actually in this segment are going to want. The Sorento HEV has a maximum brake to trailer weight of 1650 kilos, which puts it at a significant disadvantage to its most direct HEV rival, the Toyota Highlander, which can tug along a couple of tons. Uh, with a Sorento PHEV, that figure falls to just 1500 kilos. Which is why you suspect uh, Kia has elected to incorporate a bit of old school tech into this Mark IV Sorento model's powertrain lineup and include the kind of old school diesel variant that its partner Hyundai hasn't bothered with for the equivalent Santa Fe SUV. The black pump fueled engine in question is basically the same 2.2 litre CRDR unit that powered all versions of the previous generation model. It works from an 8 speed DCT automatic gearbox and develops 199 brake horsepower uh, which facilitates rest to 62 in 9.1 seconds and a top speed of 127 miles an hour. The key figure there though is the 440 newton meter torque output, that's about 25% more pulling power than the two hybrids can manage, which in turn gives you the kind of proper 2.5 tonne towing capability that some customers in this segment believe an SUV of this kind should always have. Some of them believe an SUV of this kind should also have decent off-road ability too, and the Sorento has always provided at least a bit of that, although its credentials in that regard were somewhat eroded when the second generation model uh, switched from a traditional ladder frame chassis to more car-like monocoque underpinnings. This one retains a decent degree of off-piste ability and unlike its Hyundai Santa Fe cousin, can only be had with a four-wheel drive setup, uh, one incorporating three bespoke terrain drive modes, which you select from the center console dial here, snow, mud, and sand. 
These adapt the gearbox shift times to help the car find and maintain traction in low grip surfaces. And there's downhill brake control to ease you down slippery slopes. But there's not really enough ride height to venture anywhere too gnarly with this Kia. So the terrain side of the drive mode dial will probably remain largely unused. More everyday useful stuff comes with a push of the same dial which clicks you into three separate tarmac drive modes which alter steering feel, throttle response and gear change timings uh, but not ride quality because Kia hasn't bothered with adaptive damping for the multi-link rear suspension setup. Uh, most of the time you'll leave the car in the smart setting which is basically an auto mode which sorts everything out for you. There's also an eco mode and the sports setting too for when you want to push on although you won't want to do that terribly often because at speed through tight turns there's quite a bit of roll although body stability is better than that of the previous model thanks to this fourth generation car's stiffer and more rigid N3 platform. In situations of lateness, you might be more minded to exploit the benefits of this if there was a bit more traction from the Continental Eco Contact 6 tyres. As it is, the car tends to rely heavily on the electronic stability controls and the four wheel drive system. Still, of much more interest to likely owners will be the fact that the suspension copes well uh, with tarmac tears and uneven surfaces. And of course, uh, the hybrid engines are decently quiet at a cruise, uh, which is when you might be interested to explore the advantages of Kia's latest highway driving assist system. This is standard beyond entry level trim and it's a tentative step towards autonomous driving. This works with the smart cruise control system to control steering, acceleration and deceleration in your lane while keeping a safe distance from the vehicle ahead and it will automatically control your speed according to prevailing limits. This is the sort of technology that once upon a time Sorrento owners could only dream about. Today this car can take over driving duties in traffic, dip its own headlights, prompt you to stop when you're tired and do just about everything else that a current day luxury saloon or estate could offer. Yet it remains an SUV that will please those who have always liked the multifaceted sensible attributes that this SUV model line can offer. Those folk will find a sizeable step forward has been taken here. It'll be very interesting to see how many of them are prepared to pay the price for it. Previous generations of the Sorrento have been a little anonymous and forgettable, but this fourth generation design is out to rectify that. Kia needs a bolder, more aggressive styling theme for US and Asian markets who judge large SUVs on size and presence, and the company reckons Europeans are now ready for that too. It'll be interesting to see if the sensible folk who've previously favoured this model line share that conviction. This car certainly now makes more of an overtaking statement. Kia's familiar tiger nose grille is here much wider and flanked by piercing LED headlamps featuring distinctive daytime running lights modelled apparently on a tiger's eye line. If you can stretch further than this base two-spec model, then plusher trim levels feature further embellishment with LED indicators and a glossy grille finish. Uh, below this appendage sits a wide air intake with wing-like air curtains that channel airflow around the car and a token silver skid plate further down seeks to emphasise this model's SUV credentials. In profile, you get a sense of the continuing growth that's characterised the Sorrento model line throughout its various generations. This Mark IV design is 5mm taller and it gains another 10mm of length, taking the parking space size you'll need to well over 4.8 metres, which to give you some class perspective actually puts it closer to a full fat large segment Land Rover Discovery rather than the mid-sized Discovery Sport model that it's been priced against. Uh, shorter overhangs at the front and rear, they disguise the bulk, uh, the way that the bonnet wraps over the top of the front wings is neat and a stylistic flourish is provided by this shark-like chrome dorsal fin at the base of the C-pillar. Plastic cladding frames wheel arches, housing rims of either 17 or as in this case 19 inches and the subtly swept back silhouette is emphasised by silver roof rails. 
Perhaps most distinctive, though, is the tailgate treatment borrowed from Kia's even larger US market Telluride SUV, a model the UK doesn't see. Perhaps that explains a touch of Ford Mustang in the styling of these LED tail lamps. As with other recent Kia models, the model name gets scripted out across the rear, and that emphasizes this Mark IV design's extra 10 millimeters of width. And there are touches of smart design too. Take the way that the rear wiper is neatly concealed by the roof spoiler, or the manner in which the exhausts, along with the fog and reversing lamps, get integrated into this horizontal trim finisher in the lower section of the bumper here. What matters more, of course, is the stuff that you can't see. Now this fourth generation Sorento gets Kia's much more sophisticated N3 series platform. Now this is the first of the brand's models to use that, and it's a chassis that's both lighter and stiffer than that used by the previous generation design. So a Sorento then with far higher aspirations, will that approach also be reflected by its interior design? Let's find out. Well, the cabin quality on show here is certainly a big step forward from anything we've ever seen from Kia before. Gone are the hard plastics, the clunky switch gear, and the calculator-like graphics which characterize the upfront ambiance of the previous Sorento models. And there's plenty of sophisticated screen tech to add to the more sophisticated feel here. We'll get to that in a moment. You still probably wouldn't think you were in a premium brand model. There's rather a mixture of textured surfaces and some of the finishing is slightly unusual, like the cross-hatched silver trim panels which decorate the passenger side of the fascia and the doors. But the dashboard's shelf-like design has some interesting flourishes, like the unusual shaping of these central vents. And we think that most customers will really like the way the high-set driving position offers you such a commanding view of the road ahead. Get comfortable behind this leather-stitched three-spoke wheel, and one of the first things you'll notice is that the instrument binnacle now features a single 12.3-inch screen with virtual dials, a speedometer with an integrated fuel gauge on the left, and a right-hand gauge, which either functions as a power meter for the hybrids or as a rev counter for the diesel. In between, above a permanently featured economy meter, is an information display you can format to show driving range, an energy flow monitor, trip computer data, a digital speedo, an intention level indicator, the prevailing speed limit, uh, tyre pressures, your chosen drive mode, or the tractional status of the four-wheel drive system. Quite a lot then. Uh, what you can't do, unfortunately, with this digital driver instrument cluster is view widescreen GPS mapping on it, unlike the displays offered by this model's various VW group segment rivals. Anything this screen can't tell you will probably be covered off by the infotainment monitor, which flows out of the instrument binnacle to top the center stack. Uh, this is eight inches in size with base two spec trim, as here, but with the two more opulent trim levels, you're favored instead with a preferable 10.25 inch touchscreen display, uh, which gains navigation and remote access to the car via Kia's Uvo app. Both screen options lack a voice recognition system and wireless connectivity for the incorporated Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration system. But otherwise, most of the features that you want are present and correct, although the DAB audio system has only six speakers unless you stretch to the 12-speaker Bose setup that comes with top four-spec trim. Uh, this touchscreen also includes a few extra elements you'll probably appreciate, uh, like a voice memo feature, so you can record your thoughts as you drive, and a quiet mode too, which cuts off all the rear speakers and keeps the volume of the front ones down to a preset level. That's very handy for when children might be sleeping in the back, yet you don't want to miss that song or a bit of news that you were listening to. Uh, the hybrid variants also get a dedicated electrified section, so you can monitor battery features too. What else? Uh, well, build quality, that seems solid, which to some extent makes up for the fact that some of the trimming doesn't seem particularly premium. Uh, the silver finishing around the air vents and on the doors lacks the kind of cool metallic feel you'd ideally want. There are also fewer physical buttons than you'll get in the rival Hyundai Santa Fe, which you might or might not think to be a good thing. Still, at least they are provided, uh, albeit in fiddly touch-sensitive form, for the climate control, which is a lot better than having to control ventilation via the touchscreen, as you'd have to do in a rival Peugeot 5008. And perhaps even more importantly, the seats are reasonably supportive, although disappointingly, on a car of this price, they lack lumbar support with base two-level trim, and they 
are a little awkward to adjust with this fiddly lever. Plush trim levels, of course, replace this with electric switches. There's plenty of adjustment available with the steering wheel and it gets standard heating with all trim levels, although the integrated gear shift paddles are unlikely to get much use by typical Sorento folk. All round visibility isn't bad with your over the shoulder view aided by small side windows in the deepers. Plus every variant gets all round parking sensors and a rear view camera. What about storage space? Uh, well, you get a big lidded area at the base of the center stack here, which has three USB ports. And if you avoid entry level trim, a wireless charging mat too. There are no connectivity ports though in this big lidded bin between the seats, which does incorporate a lift out tray. It has a narrow storage slot just in front and a squarical storage cubby ahead of that behind twin cup holders. Now, the glove box isn't as big as it looks, nor are the door bins which incorporate bottle holders. You get ticket clips in the sun visors, but Kia has forgotten to add an overhead sunglasses compartment. Right, time to take a seat in the second row, space in which ought to be aided by this fourth generation model's 35 mm increase in wheelbase length. The rear doors open wide through two stages, which is helpful for when you happen to be parked in a narrow underground car park bay. Inside, those familiar with the previous generation model will find that useful improvements have been made in terms of head, elbow and leg space. As usual in a seven-seat SUV, the bench slides back and forth and the backrest reclines, and that allows second row folk to prioritise either their legroom or that of those behind. Cutout sections in the front seat backs encourage an element of generosity here, and the fact that the central transmission tunnel is so low makes accommodation of a third middle-seated person more realistic. Uh, twin central vents plus a 12 volt socket and a USB port sit just above. And rather brilliantly, there are USB ports built into the seat backs here, which would be useful for front or rear passengers. If there are just two of you, you'll be able to make use of this central armrest here with its incorporated cup holders. Another rather protruding cup holder sits in each door card. Uh, this panel also incorporates a bottle holder and deep recesses in each door pull. There are also netted seat back pockets and coat hooks in the grab handles. Right, time to take a look in the third row. Getting to the rearmost chairs in an SUV of this kind is usually somewhat awkward, but this Kia has one of the best seat sliding mechanisms that we've come across. Just press this button here on top of the seat shoulder and it springs forward and tilts itself out of the way. The raised floor height though means that entry may still be slightly beyond granny on her Sunday afternoon trip to the garden center. That relatively high floor height means that, as with most cars in this class, you sit rather with your knees up towards the level of your stomach, but otherwise it is reasonably comfortable back here, by class standards anyway, although adults won't obviously want to be confined here for too long. Uh, to be fair, legroom is better than you'd get from most segment rivals, who in most cases uh, provide third row seating only suitable for those of school age. On that subject, we are disappointed to see that, as so often in this class, Isofix child seat fastenings have been forgotten back here. You do, though, get cup holders, a trinket tray and vents and USB ports on both sides with a separate climate controller and also a 12 volt socket provided on the right here. And these relatively large angular rear quarter windows prevent it feeling too claustrophobic back here. Right, let's finish with a look in the boot. It's only electrically powered if you avoid the base two level of trim we have here. The hatch opens to a wide square shaped load bay with a nice flat entry floor. It's not massively spacious of course with the third seating row up like this, but the 179 litre capacity provided in this format is enough for a couple of carry-on suitcases and it embarrasses the 115 litre space that you'd have with a similarly configured Land Rover Discovery Sport. Uh, switched with diesel power Power plant for your Sorento and that figure rises to 187 litres. Get a couple of tie downs and bag hooks but there's not much space uh, beneath the floor here which is annoying with this PHEV because there's nowhere to store the charging leads. All you get is a small underfloor compartment to the left. Still at least uh, somewhat unusually in the class, Kia does provide a space saver spare wheel that's located underneath the car. Much of the time you're going to want to tug on the pull straps on the backs of these third row chairs 
and fold them into the floor. Uh, that frees up 604 litres of space in this PHEV model. It's 608 litres in the HEV and 616 litres with the diesel. Either way, you should be able to carry up to 10 carry-on suitcases, uh, particularly if you make the second row seats a bit more upright. You can't fit in really long items though without disturbing a couple of second row passengers. And that's because Kia uh, doesn't include either a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 split for the second row backrest. If you need more room, the second row seating can be folded from the boot area by these right-hand cargo sidewall buttons, although reinstating those chairs has to be done manually from the side doors in the usual way. Uh, anyway, once everything's nice and flat, you get up to 1,988 litres of space with this plug-in hybrid. It's 1,996 litres with a self-charging hybrid, and it's 2,011 litres with the diesel. There's no mixing and matching this time around with the Sorento when it comes to seats and four-wheel drive options. All variants now get four-wheel drive and seven seats. Uh, yes, even this PHEV version. You'll find some rival plug-in SUVs lose their third seat row, so that's a plus here. But as we've remarked elsewhere in this film, the big step up in sophistication with this fourth generation model has been accompanied by a significant step up in pricing. At the time of this test in summer 2021, the asking figures started at around £40,000 and ranged up to just below £55,000. Think in terms of a premium of around £10,000 over the previous model and you won't be far out. But of course, the previous model couldn't offer the kind of hybrid electrification which is served up here. Uh, now, Kia expects most customers to want the 226 bhp HEV self-charging hybrid model that represents the most affordable choice in the range. Uh, that's because you'll need to add a premium to that of nearly £6,000 to get the more powerful 261 bhp PHEV plug-in model we're trying here, priced from launch from around £45,000. Both the hybrids can be had with all three core trim levels, two-spec, uh, that's the one we got here, and then mid-range three-trim and top four-spec. If you're interested in mid-range uh, three-spec, then your dealer will offer you the chance to turn back the clock and to have a diesel engine, a 2.2-litre CRDI unit with 199 bhp. That, at the time of this test, cost around £42,000 and would save you around £1,500 over the equivalent HEV hybrid variant. The diesel swaps the six-speed auto gearbox used by the hybrids for eight-speed DCT automatic transmission. As has always been the case throughout the history of this model lineup, pretty much all the same engineering is also offered by Kia's partner Hyundai and their very similar Santa Fe model. Now this shares the Sorento's platform and hybrid drivetrains, but no longer bothers to offer a diesel option. Uh, the other tangible difference between these two Korean models is that the Santa Fe can be had in two-wheel drive form, yet even in that base guise, it's still a thousand pounds pricier than a base two-spec four-wheel drive Sorento. Uh, Santa Fe in four-wheel drive guise start at around £42,000 at the time of this test, and that splits the Sorento's level two and level three spec options in terms of price. Ah oh yes, price. Did you ever think that a Sorento might cost you the same as a Land Rover Discovery Sport? Well, it does now, at least on the face of things. Uh, that Solihull model also offers seating for seven, and it can also be had in PHEV form, but its core power plant uses less efficient mild hybrid technology, and most mainstream variants are diesels, so your running costs for a disco are gonna be higher. Price-wise, the Sorento certainly appears to go head-to-head -head with the Land Rover, with most typical Discovery Sports selling in the 40 to 50,000 pound bracket, but you'll need to be budgeting right at the very top end of that bracket for a PHEV engine Discovery Sport, which makes the Land Rover significantly pricier than a PHEV Sorento. Kia isn't alone in chasing that Land Rover model in this class. The Volkswagen Group fields three similarly engineered, family-sized seven-seat SUV models, all recently revised. There's the Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace, the Seat Taraco, and the Skoda Kodiak. 
At first glance, uh, this trio all looks significantly cheaper than this Kia, but that's because entry-level versions get feebler engines than this Sorento uses. With a comparably powerful 200 PS diesel of the sort used in this Kia, a Kodiak or a Turaco might save you two to three thousand pounds, a Tiguan Allspace rather less than that, but the difference would probably narrow a great deal if you equalized spec to Kia levels. With the Volkswagen, uh, the Seat and the Skoda, there's no full hybrid petrol option to rival a Sorento HEV. And although you can get PHEV versions of the Tiguan Allspace and of the Turaco, those variants are difficult to compare to a slightly pricier PHEV Sorento like this one, because A, they're less powerful and perhaps more significantly, B, they can't be had with the third seating row that you can get with the plug-in version of this Kia. In the seven-seat SUV D segment, you might want to consider the Peugeot 5008, which is cheaper than this Kia, but at the time of this test, Peugeot wasn't offering that car with any hybrid powertrains, and it also lacks any kind of four-wheel drive system. A tough go-anywhere four-wheel drive setup is a calling card of the budget choice in this segment. That's the Sangyong Rexton. Uh, it certainly matches this Kia for physical stature, and it does offer impressive towing capability, but there's no kind of engine electrification at all on offer, and a relatively inefficient diesel power plant up front. If you're looking at a top-end version of the HEV Sorento variant and you can afford a little more, then much the same kind of self-charging hybrid recipe can be served up by the Toyota Highlander, which has a similar but bigger capacity power plant. But one of those costs from around, well, just over £50,000. And by the time uh, you're paying that kind of money, well, you could be looking at uh, base versions of fractionally larger premium badged models in this sector. I'm talking about models like the Volvo XE90, the Audi Q7, and the full-sized Land Rover Discovery. You would have to compromise on engine electrification to choose one of those, though. Uh, these models only come with mild hybrid tech in their most affordable forms, uh, which is, well, nothing like as efficient as the fully electrified engineering that you get in a petrol Sorento. If having considered all that, you conclude it is a Sorento that takes your interest, then you're going to need to know just how generous Kia is being here with the standard specification. So let's take a look at that now. Uh, as well as all the features that we've already mentioned, four-wheel drive, seven seats, and automatic transmission, all models include LED headlights, roof rails, rain-sensing front wipers, electrically folding exterior mirrors, uh, smart cruise control with stop and go functionality, and Kia's terrain mode select driving mode system. Plus, there's a wide range of camera safety features that we're going to brief you on in just a moment. Standard cabin items include a 12.3-inch digital instrumentation cluster screen, heat for the front seats and also for the steering wheel, and dual-zone climate control with air conditioning too for the third row of seats. Plus, there's an auto-dimming rear-view mirror and also a reversing camera which will assist the all-round parking sensors. Features specific to the base 2 grade of trim include 17-inch alloy wheels, although you get 19-inch wheels with the PHEV drivetrain. Inside with 2-spec, there's Kia's smaller 8-inch central infotainment touchscreen, which lacks navigation, but which does include Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, along with a 6-speaker DAB audio system. You're probably, though, going to want to start your Sorento search with mid-range three-spec trim. Indeed, as I mentioned earlier, if you want the diesel engine, that's what you're going to have to have. A Sorento 3 uh, offers you a few more of the niceties that you'd ideally want at this kind of price point. Uh, things like black leather upholstery, eight-way electrically adjustable front seats, uh, heating for the outer two seats in the second row there, a wireless phone charger, a glossy black center console, metal door scuff plates and a power operated tailgate. At this level in the range too, you also get uh, Kia's larger 10.25 inch center touch screen. Uh, that is now complete with satellite navigation and Kia's Uvo Connect app system. Now this allows remote connection to the car and that's so you can send route instructions to the sat nav system. You can lock or unlock the car and you can tailor your own driver settings all from the convenience of your laptop or your smartphone. Uh, three spec also gives you 
you rear self-leveling suspension and also Kia's semi-autonomous drive system. That's highway driving assist, uh, which gonna brief you on in a moment. Top four spec will bring even more luxuries with softer Nappa leather upholstery, more power adjustment for the driver's seat, along with a memory function and cooled ventilation. Plus you get some extra camera safety features, plus metal pedals, a panoramic glass sunroof with an electric roller blind and a Bose premium sound system with 12 speakers. Unlike many of its rivals, Kia doesn't offer a huge range of options, but you will probably have to pay more for your chosen paint color because the only standard shade is Essence Brown. Other colors are like this test car's mineral blue finish, sit in the brand's extra cost premium paint range. Uh, you can add some practical extras though, things like roof bars, which will allow you to add a roof box, a bike carrier, or carriers for skis and snowboards. You can also add a retractable tow bar, of course, and side steps to help entry and exit. For the cargo area, there's a boot liner, there's a bumper sill cover, and a dog guard. A finishing touch might be the stainless steel finish for the door mirror caps. On to safety, as you'd expect, there's a decent package of camera safety kit, starting with the usual autonomous braking system. Uh, Kia's is called Ford Collision Avoidance Assist, a setup that detects pedestrians, cyclists, and other vehicles in close proximity, and also oncoming traffic when you're making a turn at a junction. Uh, there's also lane keeping assist, which applies subtle steering lock if you drift out of lane. High beam assist headlights, uh, which automatically dip themselves at night. And the clever lane following assist setup. Now this works with the smart cruise control system uh, and it takes over driving duties from you in uh, heavy traffic. It controls the acceleration and the braking and also the steering. And that depends on the movements of the vehicles in front of you. So in a queue, uh, when the vehicles in front of you move off, so will you. There's also intelligent speed limit assist, which uses a camera to read speed limit signs along the road and displays them beside the speedometer and on the navigation screen. You can then decide to set your speed to the road speed limit or to override it. What else? Well, multi-collision brake assist works after an impact, braking the car so it's less likely to go on and hit something else. Uh, there's also a driver attention warning feature that monitors your reactions for drowsiness. And of course, all Sorantos come equipped with front and side airbags, as well as curtain airbags and a central bag in the dashboard. Uh, there's also auto door unlocking in the event of an impact, as well as ABS braking and electronic stability control to help you to avoid one in the first place. If you have a tow bar fitted, the car will activate a trailer stability assist system that will stop trailer snaking. For off-road terrain, there's downhill brake control where the vehicle brakes operate automatically to stabilize the car on a steep descent. If you want a bit more autonomous driving tech, mid-range three-spec includes Kia's highway driving assist system, which maintains the speed set by the driver or the speed limit of the motorway. At the same time, it controls steering, acceleration and deceleration in your lane while keeping a safe distance from the vehicle ahead. Uh, this feature is also designed to automatically adjust your speed based on the speed limit of the road detected through the uh, navigation system. So uh, if you happen to have the speed set at 70 miles an hour on the motorway and the limit changes to 50, then the car will automatically lower its speed to suit. Top spec four trim adds three further features. There's a blind spot view monitor, which stops you from dangerously pulling out in front of oncoming vehicles. You get a parking collision avoidance assist system, which at low speeds uses the rear view camera and parking sensors to detect obstacles that you might not have seen. Uh, for example, a pedestrian walking behind you or a low wall, and it automatically applies the brakes to avoid an impact if you're not responding to the warnings. And there is also rear cross traffic collision avoidance assist, which alerts you to oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a space. It's all very reassuring. With previous generation versions of this car, no typical Sorrento customer would have even considered choosing one with a petrol engine, much less one just 1.6 litres in size. Yet with diesel fuel falling out of favour, that's exactly what Kia is now asking its customers to do. 
Uh, thankfully, the inclusion of a turbocharger and quite a bit of hybrid electrification helped the transition. We covered just how much electrification you get in our driving experience section, uh, quite a bit it turns out, and a lot more than is offered by the so-called mild hybrids offered in the segment by brands like Land Rover, uh, engines which can't ever independently drive the car on battery power alone. The HEV self-charging unit fitted to the hybrid petrol model that Kia expects most Sorento customers to choose can certainly do that, although not for very long thanks to the combination of a two-ton curb weight, a relatively feeble 59 brake horsepower electric motor and the small size of the 1.49 kilowatt hour lithium ion polymer battery pack that powers it. Still, the HEV model's 40.9 miles per gallon combined cycle fuel showing is pretty much the same as you'd get from an equivalent powerful diesel version of a rival, even as in the case of a Land Rover Discovery Sport, a mild hybrid embellished one. The self-charging Sorento model's 158 grams per kilometre CO2 reading matches those black pump fueled SUV rivals too, and you'll be running on cheaper fuel, so it's all good but not quite as good, of course, as the readings that you'll get if you stump up the considerable amount extra that Kia wants for the PHEV plug-in version of this model that we're trying today. As we said in our driving section, the fact that you get a larger 90 brake horsepower electric motor powered by a considerably larger 13.8 kilowatt hour battery makes all the difference. It gives you the usual PHEV three-figure combined economy reading, in this case 176.6 mpg, and an enviro-conscious CO2 figure of just 38 grams per kilometre. That in turn makes possible a super low benefit in kind taxation rating of just 11%. The HEV self-charging hybrid version can't get anywhere near that. It's rated at 35% or 37% with top spec 4 trim. At the time this test in summer 2021, for a 20% taxpayer, the BIK tax bill for a Sorento HEV with mainstream 2 or 3 spec trim was roughly £2,700 or £227 a month. For a 40% taxpayer, those figures would be £5,438 a year or £453 a month all of which is virtually the same as you'll pay for the single 2.2 litre CRDI diesel version of this car, which Kia continues to offer, also BIK rated at 37%. That diesel delivers a combined MPG figure of 42.2 miles per gallon and a 176 grams per kilometre CO2 reading, uh, figures which are on a par with typical diesel rivals. Whatever Sorento powertrain you choose to help you get somewhere close to the quoted fuel figures, uh, you'll need to keep this Kia as regularly as possible in its eco drive mode, which slightly restricts throttle travel and the climate system output. In this PHEV model, if the battery is charged, you can switch to full electric mode too, and that allows the car to travel up to 35 miles on battery power alone, a range potential we found to be surprisingly achievable throughout this test. Kia suggests that sticking to an urban environment could actually see this figure climb to a very reasonable 43 miles before the engine would have to cut in. On to VED road tax, again there are big advantages here with hybrid drive. You'll pay nothing in VED for year one of ownership with this PHEV model. It's £545 in year one for the HEV and £895 for the diesel. Bear in mind that any car that costs more than £40,000, as virtually all Sorento models now do, is liable for an additional £335 payment for the first five times the tax is renewed. Uh, you'll also want to know about likely depreciation with a volume brand badged large SUV of this kind of price. Well, it's reasonably class competitive, uh, think around 55%. To be more specific, after three years and 60,000 miles, industry experts reckon that a base two-spec HEV model will still be worth £17,450. For this two-spec PHEV, it'll be £18,200. For the single three-spec CRDI diesel, the figure would be £17,775. A big draw with any new kit is the comprehensive warranty package which comes along with it. And sure enough, here you get a transferable 7-year, 100,000 mile warranty package which shows the faith and confidence that the company has in its products. There's also a 12-year anti-perforation and a 5-year paint warranty to even further cement the longevity of this car.
Servicing is every 10,000 miles on the two petrol hybrids, uh, which extends to 20,000 miles on the diesel. Uh, should those mileages not be achieved, then servicing is still required annually. Uh, Kia offers a series of servicing plans uh, lasting for two, three or five years. At the time of this test, in summer 2021, the shortest plan cost £435, but adding another year up to 699 The longest plan was priced at £1,229. Whether you opt for those packages or not, uh, you'll benefit from the Kia Promise, which uh, alongside the warranty package also includes convenient online service booking, uh, accident care and the highest level of RAC roadside assistance, which includes onward travel and European cover too. Insurance ratings are a little higher than those of obvious rivals. For the HEV self-charging hybrid, they start at Group 30 for Level 2 trim, they rise to Group 31 for the Level 3 car and Group 32 for the top 4-spec model. If you choose this PHEV, uh, then this alters slightly to Groups 32, 33 and 34 respectively. The lone diesel variant, that sits in Group 31. This fourth generation Sorento tells us a lot about the way that Kia is developing as a brand. It undercuts its Hyundai Santa Fe stablemate on price and its extra polish and cleverness now make choosing this car a more credible option for buyers who simply don't need the dynamic advantages on offer from the much pricier Land Rover and German branded models that you might be tempted by in this segment. This fourth generation design is more confident in almost every way than anything we've previously seen from this model line, whether you consider technology, pricing or the bold styling statement it makes. Couple that with a family friendly interior, drive trains that are perfect for the more considerate climate that we find ourselves in and an air of quality that's usually associated more with uh, European familiar badges and you could well conclude as we have that this car makes a good case for itself. Not least because it's one of the only contenders in this class which offers a choice of either a self-charging HEV full hybrid, a plug-in PHEV hybrid or a more traditional turbo diesel powertrain. So the appeal here is potentially broader than anything Kia has provided in this segment before. But is it all enough to justify the much larger price tags that the brand's asking for here? That's a much more difficult question to answer and it's one you'll need to consider against the backdrop of the significant steps forward in quality, style and technology that have been achieved here. For some, all of this still won't be enough to keep this car in the frame against rivals with more established badge work, but uh, those cars may well cost you quite a lot more when you come to compare like with like. And when you've lived with a Sorento for a little while, as we have on this test, you might well end up concluding that rivals don't really offer very much more for the money. Some of them do tow a lot better though, and that is a drawback of the relatively small capacity 1.6 litre engine that Kia uses for its hybrids. Still, the diesel variant does remain on offer if that's a key requirement for you. And in summary, while well, those familiar with the Amalfi Coast might still feel the Sorento to be lacking an R, a glance at the spec sheet doesn't immediately suggest it's lacking very much else. In short then, for all kinds of reasons, we think this is now a contender that you'd like rather than merely one that it would be very handy to have. The kind of SUV that might surprise you, as increasingly modern Kias tend to do.